Okay, good afternoon. Wow. Okay, all of you are still alive, alert, excited. It's post lunch. My stomach's full. Someone over here has like a 32 ounce Red Bull. You know, this is gonna be a good session. Let's do this. <laughs> if anyone gets tired or feels a little sleepy, this gentleman over here <laughs> will be doing Red Bull shots for everybody. Um, so my name's Jackie Sandmeyer. I'm the campus coordinator for the Oregon Attorney General Sexual Assault Task Force, which is a lot of stuff to throw on one business card. And if you want one, I have some. <laughs> um, but most folks call us the task force or SATF. Um, really what that means is that I have the unique role of working with all of the colleges and universities in the state of Oregon, and that includes all the four-year public-private schools and then also all of our um, 17 community colleges. And what's really exciting about this role is that I get to travel around the state and come to all the different campuses, and this is the first time I've been here at Eastern, um, so it's about time, and y'all have been putting on a good sell. I drove in here, it was like the sunset. I mean, <laughs> I was talking to someone from Portland, they're like, how is it? I was like, it's really nice, like you need to come back to Portland. <laughs> So no, thank you um, for having me here, and this has been exciting to see your campus and interact with so many of you. Um, my quick disclaimer is always, this isn't legal advice, I'm not giving you legal advice. I doubt any of you came here for that in the first place, but you know, if you have a really good story, I'll never say no to listening to it. <laughs> um, the task force itself um, was created by former Attorney General Hardy Meyer, and since then we've actually, uh, attained 501c3 status, so we're interesting that we're a nonprofit now, but um, all of our programs are either funded through the State Department of Justice or federally funded. Um, and the most interesting thing about the task force that I think makes me lucky to work there is that we're one of the only organizations in the country that we have all the direct service providers that work with sexual assault victims coming to one place, which means quarterly, um, every year, quarterly, we have law enforcement, prosecutors, other criminal justice folks, medical forensics, sexual assault nurse examiners, even offender management, direct service advocates, those who do prevention and education training in K through 12, higher ed folks, and legislative public policy makers all coming to one place saying, what does this look like? What are our roles? How do we work better with each other? And how do we do a better job in Oregon? Now when I travel nationally, that's a big deal that we <laughs> have these types of connections here in Oregon. And I would say also not only just being the forefront in this conversation in general, we're um, lucky enough to be at the forefront on a campus level. And we'll talk about sort of Title IX and where Title IX came from and where we are today. Um, but a lot of shift has happened and we're very lucky here in Oregon that you know, I'm able to travel to the different campuses and have these conversations and that you all who are on campus every day um, come to trainings like this and dedicate the time that you each put in. So a little look at the work in general. Um, most folks have been doing student affairs work or higher ed work for a while or um, some type of faculty position. For a while we're not hearing of Title IX and now it's re-emerged. Um, for years, most of the folks serving students on campus who are experiencing sexual violence were those in the community. So community advocates were serving students. And then an interesting shift happened where student organizations, um, student government, women's center, those types of organizations were taking on the work and saying, you know, this is happening on our campuses. We have students who are experiencing it, so it needs to start becoming part of the dialogue in higher ed. And after that, um, we started to look more towards Title IX interpret it a little differently, and now we're at the point where most folks have heard of Title IX in some capacity. How many folks in this room have originally thought of Title IX as women's athletics? Yeah, that's, <laughs> I like how folks raise their hand, they like, even though everyone around you is also raising your hand, it's okay, it's a safe space. <laughs> um, so most individuals thought that it was around women's athletics only, and it's very interesting because whenever I would tell people what job I did, they would always say, oh, so you work with like women's athletic coaches. I'm like not quite, but sometimes they're in the room and that's good. Um, but most of our students nowadays do not resonate Title IX with that anymore. We're sort of past that conversation. And now if you were to ask most students what they think Title IX is about, it resonates with them with the campus sexual assault conversations. 
Um, so if you were ever to look up the federal law of Title IX, you'll end up with this huge 100-page stack of paper. It's not that interesting. Um, but if you're into that type of nighttime reading, feel free. Um, be my guest. But what Title IX actually said was uh, mostly around discrimination based in gender, sex, and access to education. So it's this idea that everybody had a right to education and a safe space in doing that, and that no one person could be discriminated against based on gender or sex while seeking that education. Now we've come a long way from women's sports teams to sort of where we're at today. Um, one thing that I acknowledge while we're going through this conversation, and I'm sure it'll come up while you all think of how this applies to your role on campus, is that there's a lot of this conversation that has to do with federal laws, state laws. At least every six months, there's a new law that we're constantly trying to keep up with around this conversation, which means training constantly changes. All of your roles on campus are changing every year, and it's hard for us to keep up with. But what I've really appreciated is that amongst Title IX, the Cleary Act, VAWA, and a slew of other laws I could throw up there. In the overlap, we've started to have this conversation beyond what the law is, and we've started to ask ourselves what's best for students. Now, I know that sounds very obvious, um, but for years, that wasn't the conversation. You know, just five or 10 years ago, if you were sitting in this room going through a responsible employee training or training on Title IX, You'd have an attorney up here stand here and bullet point you different segments of the law and you would all be very bored but kind and patient and listen and you'd be looking at excerpts from the federal law and talking about how that may or may not apply um, but we've moved beyond that now now we're focusing on this middle ground of if we always aim for what's best for students if we take the students best interest into consideration and we know what works well we will always fit that into the framework of title IX. So I like to think that the conversation now is sort of a balance that we're finding. So on one end, we have this new element of what's student-centered. And that looks like a few things. One is what's best practice? What have we done? What should we do differently? What's worked well? Um, the other piece is acknowledging that students who experience violence on campus are going through some type of trauma. It's a traumatic experience. They're experiencing trauma on campus, and that intersects with them being a student. It's hard to do well in class when you're stressed about something else. It's hard to be on campus if you're afraid of someone on campus. The other element that sort of falls into this is how do we make it align with what we know to be best practice with an anti-violence work? How do we re-empower students after they've experienced this? And what does that look like when we intermingle it with higher education best practice? Now on the flip side, all the legalese and the compliance in Title IX, uh, we also have these important conversations of being objective, um, and then also being neutral within our policies. And what I like to point out is that these two conversations are never mutually exclusive. To be student-centered isn't mutually exclusive to compliance and vice versa. We can always find a balance between the two. And that's what I'm hoping we can sort of flush out today is, you know, what are employees obligated to do on campus and what is it that we need to be doing with students? What do students expect from us under Title IX? But most of all, how do we approach those things in a way that's you know, the most empathetic and compassionate ways for our students so that we can ensure that students stay on campus so that they graduate and they reach that goal um, that we all hope that they're prospering in, a, in an academic way as well. Um, so one thing is we've seen this shift not just happen here in Oregon and on our campuses, but also nationally. So a lot of this conversation started out with the Dear Colleague letter in 2011. You know, it's when this letter came down from the federal government, and it basically said, hey, colleges, Title IX's part of your job. No one's doing it well. As you can imagine, that was a really stressful letter. Um, it'd be equivalent to if your boss never gave you an employee review and then just sent you a letter and said that you're really crappy at your job. <laughs> um, and no one likes letters from the federal government. It's like extra scary. You know, it's like tax season. Um, then later, for the first time, the White House really took an interest in campus sexual assault. Joe Biden and Obama created a White House task force that specifically looked at the topic of sexual assault on campuses. Um, the notalone.gov website was created, which I recommend folks take a look at. Um, most of all, what I think the notalone.gov website meant for people is that you know, a huge chunk of it's dedicated to schools, best practices, what resources are out there. But what people forget is that a whole half of the website is dedicated to students. 
which means we have a student population on our campus for the first time that's more educated on Title IX than any of us were when we went to college. They now have a place to access what their rights are, what Title IX is, what falls under Title IX, all of these questions. And even here in the state of Oregon, we're one of the only states in the country that has our own state-specific student reporting options website. Um, it's called, I know I'm gonna mess it up, campus.oregonsatf.org, got that last part. Um, where students can anonymously look up what Title IX is, what their school's policies are, different things like that. Which means that, you know, as students are starting to shift their conversations around this, we need to keep up with the conversations. The other things that happened were guidance was starting to come out that wasn't just talking about compliance, but that was also carving out space for best practices. It was starting to have these conversations about what do students experience, how do those experiences play out on campuses, and then how can we best navigate that with them. The other thing that happened, of course, in 2014 was the publication list of OCR where they were starting to release which schools were being investigated, and I think most folks at that time were looking at whether or not the school they worked at was on the list, whether or not the schools they went to, the schools their kids went to um, were on that list, and it was a time when it hit national precedence. Um, I don't know if folks remember watching the Super Bowl in 2014, but it was the first time in history that a president interrupted the Super Bowl commercials and occupied like a $6 million commercial slot to declare campus sexual assault a national emergency. Um, it was really interesting, I remember watching it because Obama came on right after a Budweiser ad and right before Katy Perry. So it was, that was memorable for me enough. <laughs> I'd like to think that was like a strategic move on his part. Um, the other thing that happened sort of in this transition that we're seeing of conversation is forever Title IX was just about sexual assault. That's how we were talking about it. That's how students related to it. That was the national conversations. Um, that, was the con that was the questions we were asking. It was about what was sexual assault on campus and what did that look like? Um, in 2014, we had a reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act that applied to one of the multitude of higher education laws. And it, for the first time, laid out not just sexual assault, but it added stalking, domestic violence, and dating violence to that list as well. Now, you can imagine what happened after that um, addition of that language, we all of a sudden started getting a lot more cases on campus of stalking, domestic violence, and dating violence. And as we can all um, probably deduce, stalking didn't start in 2015. Um, but what we learned was that because we were giving students more language and reaching out to them more clearly about what they could seek out for services, students were hearing that and then reaching out to the college. Um, so we'll go into it later today about what language does and how our language focuses on whether or not students come forward. But I think that's a really good example of the fact of just adding those terms, um, let students know that they could come forward for those types of things. I'll also point out that dating violence was added because um, when there was just the addition of domestic violence, most students still weren't coming forward. And when asked, a lot of them said, you know, we don't resonate with the word domestic violence. We don't live together. Um, some of our relationships are more casual than permanent. Um, so again, thinking about language and how we articulate violence to students and how um, students are identifying it with it on their own. And then of course here in Oregon we've had some different laws happen, um, a lot around victims knowing their rights within the process and the criminal process, and then a lot around getting students more options, more options to seek services, more options to report, and more options to get confidential services as well. Um, the other interesting thing is that for campuses, a lot of folks have sort of had this question around, are campuses uniquely unsafe? So what we know is nationally, one in five women on campus will experience sexual assault in the four years that they're on campus. So if we were to think of a traditional bachelor's degree from the time they enter as a freshman to when they graduate as a senior, one in five will be sexually assaulted within that four years of them being a student. Now that's a lot when we think of if you were to walk into a classroom of maybe 30 people and you were to think that one in five in that classroom will be assaulted while they're on this campus, um, that's a pretty drastic number when we start multiplying that to our student body. What I think is important is to hone that in with community prevalences as well. One reason to point out that campuses really are a reflection of what we know in the community um, to be true. 
So in Oregon, it's actually one in four. We just got our updated statistics, um, which is higher than even one in six. And that's a lot to take in as Oregonians, I think, too. Um, and the piece about the statistic is I want you to think of how it's phrased as well. So it's one in, one in four now. Adult women have been the victim of forcible rape in her lifetime. There's a lot of individuals who aren't even included in that statistic. So who may not be included in this? It's okay, you're digesting. Children? Anyone who's not an adult? Yep, someone who never told anyone. Men. What about the word forcible rape? That's really restricting. So what it's saying is that only people who met the statutory definition of forcible rape are included in the statistic. So one in four is a lot to take, and I, and I fully appreciate that that number is a um, hard one to understand, but I also never want us to lose sight of the fact that when you see these types of statistics, it's still only encapsulating a small niche of individuals who are experiencing violence. You know, anyone that's under 18 doesn't fall into this, anyone who doesn't identify as a woman, anybody who doesn't meet the statutory definition, there's a lot of individuals who don't fall into these statistics. Um, the other thing of why I appreciate us looking at the community prevalence as well as the campus is that we need to remember that our students never approach our campus in a vacuum. They were community members before they entered onto our campuses, and even once they're on campus, they're still involved in the community which means that we have many students who may have come to campus as freshmen or non-traditional tr non students first coming to campus who have experienced some type of violence before they even came here. The other thing I like to point out when we look at statistics like this is that it's not just students and particularly women who are at high risk of this. We can look at statistics and pull away two things. One is that there's certain groups certain populations who are at high risk of perpetration, um, and we'll go into perpetration at some point today, but the other piece is that there's certain groups of individuals who are also at high risk for victimization. And when we look at who these populations are, we see a distinct intersection between the fact that marginalized populations and sexual violence go hand in hand, which means that sexual violence has some intersection with oppression, and how that our society and our community puts value on individuals. So when we look on Oregon campuses specifically, this is the list of individuals who are at highest risk of experiencing sexual violence on our campuses. So there's a lot of folks on here, um, people with dis disabilities, deaf and hard of hearing, um, individuals who are underage who participate in drinking, non-traditional students, communities of color, gender minorities, LGBT students, um, I'd also like to point out that there's individuals on this list who it's worth putting the list up because it's easy for us to ignore those populations. Um, for example, a lot of campuses, I may talk to their staff and faculty and they would say they don't have undocumented students. And I would push back and say, you most likely do. Same with homeless students, same with students who are participating in some type of sex work to pay for tuition. All these populations exist on our campus, and the better we are at acknowledging those students, the better we can be at providing them services. Because when we go into the dynamics of perpetration, we'll see that one of the reasons why those students are being targeted is because they are a silent population on campus. So the less power someone has on campus, the more likely they are to be targeted. Um, I'll also say that the more we know about these communities, the more that we can serve them better. Um, when I was an undergrad, I was one of those students that it took me six years to get my four-year degree, because I'm extra smart. Um, <laughs> takes that extra two. Um, out of six years, four of them I was homeless for. And it's interesting because I don't think a single person on my campus knew that. And a lot of it had to do with, because back then in higher education, we didn't acknowledge that population existing in higher ed. Um, and on top of that, even if we had acknowledged them, there wasn't a lot of support services around it. So we're getting better at having to face who's on our campuses and the needs that those specific populations have. I also think that um, it's one thing to say some people are at higher risk, but I think it's more important for us to have to actually look at the numbers. Because what does higher risk actually mean? Um, so there's some different things we can look at. You know, immigrant and refugee women 
they have a one in two chance of experiencing sexual violence on campus. Um, our Native American women are much higher as well. Um, the one statistic on here that's changed drastically in the last year that I need to update is for our transgender students, we're now realizing it's 80 to 90% of them will be sexually assaulted while in college. Which for those students, what that means is that when they um, walk onto your campus, it's not that they may experience violence, but those students have the mentality um, because of the rates that they will most likely experience violence. Or that violence will in some part be part of their higher ed experience. Um, the other one that I put up here for good reason is the one in three child abuse survivors because again, students don't come to us in a vacuum. So if a student had experienced some type of child abuse, they have a one in three chance once they get to campus of experiencing sexual violence again. One thing that we noticed um, going around talking to students, and we noticed a lot when we were doing our campus reporting website, because we did a lot of focus groups around that of you know, what students knew, how they interpreted language, is that students will tell you if they're, not, if they're part of a marginalized population that they didn't realize Title IX applied to them. This is especially true of our male students. Um, so the US Department of Education, as well as here in Oregon, we've been trying our best to come up with language that pushes the um, ideas that we have around Title IX, that pushes us away from this idea that it's just for women. So the US Department of Ed came out with this a couple years ago, saying all students are protected by Title IX, regardless of whether they have a disability, are international or undocumented, and regardless of their sexual orientation and gender identity. And it's interesting because just adding that type of language, saying all are included, you, we already had so many more students outside of mainstream populations coming forward and acknowledging now that they um, fell under services and support services that the school had to offer. And as you can imagine in extension, this does a lot for student retention and this does a lot for academic success. The other thing that's interesting, we look into why do students come forward or why do they choose not to come forward and how do they experience um, their time on campus is when we look at the myths and misconceptions that are out there. So everyone in this room, we could all jot down on a piece of paper myths and misconceptions we've heard about sexual assault. And believe it or not, we'd all come up with something very similar. Um, before I did the position I have now at the task force, I was training law enforcement and prosecutors in the criminal justice realm because that was my hiatus from higher ed because I thought prosecutors and cops were gonna be way easier. I'm not totally sure where that came from, but um, one thing that you notice is that every discipline I've ever trained, every campus I've ever been to, across the board, we can come up with the same myths. You know, we could all um, say she was asking for it, what was she wearing, she was intoxicated, um, she was lying, which says that if we can all come up with the same list, so can our students. And it's true, if you sit down with your students and you ask them stereotypes about victims or perpetrators, they have a pretty succinct list of the same things we've heard. Um, which tells us that when a student experiences violence on campus, one, they're already hearing those myths from themselves, so they're asking themselves, you know, is this true about me? But on the flip side, they're also, also going to assume that all of you in this room hold those to be true. Now, that was a hard part for me as a direct service provider because I'd like to think that I was a compassionate person who cared about students, but I challenge you all to think about the fact that it has nothing, it's not a reflection of you as an individual. Um, our role is to understand that students, rightfully so, may assume that we think these things to be true, but we've also seen that we can very successfully on campuses foster an environment that defeats these myths purely by how students see us reflect zero tolerance attitudes towards harassment, bullying, and violence. So one myth that we've seen held on to over the years was this idea that Sexual violence, domestic violence, they were all different things and had to, do, had to do with different origins. So sexual assault had to do with sex, domestic violence had to do with physical altercations, and these were all very succinct and different. Um, what we learned about a decade ago that's changed our response on every level, campuses, in the community, criminal justice, is that all types of violence have to do with power and control. So it's one person taking power away from another person and exerting power over them. Which makes a lot more sense when we go into who's at rates of victimization and who's most likely perpetrators um, because it's about who on our campuses are in positions of power in our student body and then who on our campuses um, maybe have less power. And it also helped us because for years we always thought that people experienced 
certain types of violence at a time. So for example, a student may come to the Title IX office and say that they were sexually assaulted, and we sort of left it at that. We got them services for that, we approached that investigation, we dealt with that claim. Um, from higher ed, even into the community, once we started surveying victims who sought out services about you know, what types of violence they experienced, what services they got, across the board, we started to see individuals who were experiencing physical violence who never got services for it. And when the question was asked, why did you never tell anyone about the physical violence when you were reporting the sexual assault, um, overwhelmingly, a majority of them said, because nobody ever asked me. So we were thinking so insular about types of violence and what perpetuated them, what caused them, and how students experienced them that we were missing this whole other gap of their safety. The other interesting thing about this myth level is that we can actually quantify how students accept certain myths about sexual violence. Um, so in campus climate surveys and other access we have to students survey-wise, um, we can measure their acceptance of these four sort of commonly believed myths. So she asked for it, he didn't mean to, it wasn't really rape and she lied. So we can ask a question like, um, if a girl is raped while she is drunk, she's at least somewhat responsible to letting things get out of hand. Now, a lot of our students across the state and the country will fall somewhere either in the middle or towards strongly agree. And the same goes for um, if a girl doesn't physically resist sex, even if protesting verbally, it can't be considered rape, and so on. Now, as scary as that sounds, <laughs> that our students are coming to us somewhere in the middle or towards strongly agree, um, I think the exciting thing that we've seen is that we can get students from a one to a five in four years of school. Because now that we're doing so much more awareness building, having way more conversations on campus about this, and our institutions are taking a more zero tolerance towards harassment, violence, and other types of um, abuse and bullying, just the reflection of a community that doesn't tolerate those types of behaviors will slowly shift students just in four years from a one to a five. That's huge. That means we're actually changing mindsets of a whole student population purely on how all of us as staff, employees, and faculty um, are portraying some type of attitude towards that behavior. The other thing that's interesting about the rape myth acceptance is we can directly link it to bystander intervention. So whether or not a student sees their classmate hurt in some way and they step in. Now what I found was interesting about this is that it has nothing to do about whether or not that student cares for their peers or whether or not that student wants their peers to be safe. A lot of it has to do with whether or not students can recognize violence when they see it happen. Um, so, for example, the further a student scores towards strongly agree, the less likely they are to ever intervene when a friend is being abused. And a lot of it came down to when they were showing students um, like a clip of a video, and some campuses do this as part of their um, test of campus climate, and they'll show them a video and maybe it's an argument between a couple at the library. So this couple's in front of the library, and it's verbal, it escalates, maybe they start shoving each other, and they'll ask the students, would you intervene? And most students said no, and when asked why, they said, you know, maybe that's just how their relationship is, it seems personal, I probably wouldn't tell anybody, I don't know a lot about their relationship. And they kept doing this with different scenarios of different types of violence, and what we noticed was that students have been in so many experiences of normalizing violence, when they see violence happen, um, it's hard for them to register that it's something that shouldn't be happening on campus. And unfortunately, we see the same thing with sexual assault, um, which gives us a good idea of why a lot of the times when sexual assaults occur on campuses, there's other folks who may have witnessed it happen or seen things lead up to it, but nobody steps in. Now, what's interesting as far as the victim's experience in all of this is that we have a lot that we can do as you know, staff, faculty, employees of universities to curb that attitude. Um, because it's not just the victim and the perpetrator in the conversation, there's also um, the peer group, the student group, student government, residence halls, those who have a lot of direct contact with students, and then also just the larger campus community. So we've seen that victims tend to look to um, the other staff and employees of the campus that they tend to trust to see how they react to different types of experiences on campus. The other interesting thing is language. 
So what language do we give students to identify consent, and then what language do we give them to identify the violence that they experience? Um, one thing we used to do is we used to try to figure out prevalence rates here in Oregon, and we'd say, have you ever been sexually assaulted? So you could ask 100 students, have you ever been sexually assaulted? Maybe 10 of them would say yes. But then you can ask those same 100 students, has someone had oral sex with you or made you to have oral sex with them without your consent? And maybe 30 students will say yes. And that was really confusing because you asked those 100 students if they'd ever been sexually assaulted in two different ways, and yet less students answered yes to the first one, which showed us that students didn't always resonate with the word sexual assault or dating violence or domestic violence or stalking. Um, they resonated a lot more with behaviors. Like, did something happen to you that was unwanted? Um, did it make you feel unsafe? which shows us that the way that we all think of sexual violence and the way we think of it contextually as far as um, you know, calling it sexual assault, dating violence, those types of things, a lot of the time students aren't resonating their experiences that way. And so we've seen a lot of shift on campuses about how we talk about, about it. And this is especially true in classrooms, um, athletic teams, student groups, student government, residence halls, times when we're actually having direct contact with students, having those conversations. Um, or when you're developing language on your syllabi, different things like this that we can have a much greater impact if we think about the language we're choosing. Um, the other thing is, you know, what language is out there available to them? So some, someone once told me, they're like, well, I don't understand how a student doesn't understand what violence is because there's so many ways that we define it. I go, okay, so let's look at the Oregon Criminal Code. Um, I think most students who are at the point where they realize something bad happened to them at, after a party are not going to look at this and think, okay, I'm a victim above 12 years old, but I'm under 16, but maybe I was incapable of consent, um, but I don't know if it's a first degree. Um, I would just say that most of us who don't have a advanced legal degree would not look to this um, to name an experience that happened to them on campus. Similarly, the only other definition that we tend to give them on campus is the FBI's federal definition, because it's required in our annual security reports, um, which is not super helpful either. Um, it's not something that students resonate with. So what we've learned is that we need to go steps further. So here's the task force um, definition of what sexual assault is, and we say, a sexual act is non-consensual if it's inflicted upon a person who's, one, unable to grant consent. So who in the state of Oregon cannot grant consent? Okay, someone said minors. Yeah, intoxicated or incapacitation. What was that one? Okay, so um, some type of disability. And then there's one more. That would fall under disabilities. What about the opposite of minors? Yeah, the elder population. Um, so that's sort of easy to understand, these ideas of age, capacitation, mental capability, physical capability. But the other part was really important too. Beyond that, it's an unwanted and compelled through the use of physical force, manipulation, coercion, threats, or intimidation. Um, now, how many people in this room were raised around the no means no campaign? Like that's how you talked about consent and were educated around it was no means no. Yeah, we've really shifted away from that because what happens if you don't say no? What is it then? A lot of people would say it's a yes. Um, so going these extra steps of, you know, if you are forced through physical force or fear or you're afraid to say no, that does not constitute a yes. Um, and a lot of this helped us to have conversations with students around what did consent look like in ways that a lot of students will tell you that saying no, they don't feel like is an option because they're afraid. Um, that also led us to come up with different definitions for consent. So instead of just saying no means no or yes means yes, we started to say things like if it's the presence of a yes when no is a viable option. So we can think of all types of scenarios where no may not be a viable option, where they feel pressured, afraid, threatened. Um, the other thing is going really in depth about silence doesn't constitute consent, or that resistance isn't required. Um, here in Oregon about a decade ago, we still had on the books that if you were to be 
prosecuted criminally for a sex crime, you, the victim had to prove to a certain degree that they fought back um, actually in court. And incapacitation, sadly enough, wasn't added onto our um, books for consent until about like a decade ago as well. And so having these conversations and highlighting these different things was helpful to get students to come forward. The other piece was when we started to look into what, how were students disclosing and then what did that look like? So when they did a lot of surveys for staff and faculty um, on campus who were receiving disclosures, they realized that they said about 31% of those students were in crisis during the disclosure. Now in most of those situations, it was where a student had experienced a type of violence, didn't tell anyone for a while, and then the culmination of academics plus stress plus whatever other trauma they were going to hit a boiling point to the point where they just had to tell somebody. The other thing we noticed is about 93% that the student said the student never asked for any academic accommodations. Now that's interesting because um, for a while we thought that disclosures were happening because students were concerned about a test, an assignment, they needed it to be moved. Um, but what we realized is a lot of the times the students just felt comfortable with the person they told. Maybe you're a student advisor, for a student group or a department or you're a faculty member, those individuals who students saw a lot of the times, they felt more comfortable telling that to that person. Um, the other thing we saw is about 30% happen in office hours. So if you're faculty, it's the office hours you have towards your students. Um, for everyone else, that's the time you're fulfilling the role that you're interacting with students. Um, we also realized that 20% happen over email and about 16 over an assignment. So if a professor was to say, um, write an assignment on something that impacted your life, then students, um, about 16% of the time, students would disclose some type of violence in that um, assignment. Now, this all sort of lends itself to this conversation around responsible employees on campus, what does that look like, and then what is the role of responsible employees? Um, so as far as Title IX goes, they categorize responsible employees as three different types of folks. So the first one is if you have the authority to take action to redress the harassment. So a lot of times we'll think of maybe you're a faculty member and if there was harassment or bullying happening within your classroom during some type of group discussion, you have the authority to redress that in some way. You can take back control of the conversation, you can ask someone to step outside, you can redirect that classroom to make it a safe space. The second one is where you know I tend to highlight because this is how most folks fall into the category. And it's um, if you've been given the duty to report harassment or other types of misconduct to appropriate officials. Now that just basically means if your school has deemed you a responsible employee. Um, and it's a little confusing because there's no bright line answer, but really under Title IX, the school can deem whoever they want a responsible employee. And in Oregon, that means most of our staff and faculty and almost all of, um, in fact, almost all of our faculty are responsible employees. Um, and then the last one has more to do with K through 12, but it was um, if, so, if a student could reasonably believe that they have the authority or responsibility. And that had to do with really small children. Like if you asked a six-year-old, does the person who worked for facilities, do you think they're an adult who could do something to help you? Most little kids would say yes. Now, um, what I've noticed is a lot of folks get confused between mandated reporting and responsible employee. Um, I think most folks have heard the term mandatory reporter, but responsible employee is a lot less used. And it's funny because I've been doing this work for so long, I, get, I completely forget that the fact that responsible employee is not even a term that's part of normal colloquialisms. I was on my way here and a friend of mine just recently got a higher ed position. And she goes, oh, you know, they told me I have to show up for my responsible employee training. And I was like, oh, interesting. She's like, so I have a question, but it might be kind of dumb. And I was like, okay, hit me with it. I've heard it all. And she goes, so wait, are they assuming I'm an irresponsible employee? <laughs> and I was like, that's a really good question. Um, but really just knowing responsible employees like this term of art under Title IX, um, which is important because mandatory reporters and responsible employees are two different things. So some of you have been mandatory reporters in other jobs you've had. Um, you know, some healthcare professionals are mandatory reporters. Um, if you work with children, sometimes you're a mandatory reporter. But that just really means that through the state of Oregon, you're mandated to report child abuse, abuse towards folks with disabilities, and then ab um, elder abuse. 
Responsible employees are unique to higher education. If you've never worked on a campus, or for, if you're having a conversation with someone who's never worked on a campus, responsible employees are very unique to higher ed. Um, what it's saying is, whoops, what it's saying is that any employee who receives some type of constructive notice of sexual harassment, sexual violence, has to tell the Title IX office. And it's important because in the grander scheme of Title IX, um, it, it triggers the fact that the university has to do something about it, to put it sort of plainly. And the has to do something about it sometimes sounds a little scarier than what we think it is. So the has to do something about it means that that student now is getting access to support services, academic accommodations, maybe they need their dorm changed, they need their job changed, um, maybe they need to take a leave for the semester, maybe that student needs a test moved or they need to talk to somebody about a scholarship or their GPA. There's a whole area of things that fall into that. Now what's most important is that you know, Title IX says a responsible employee okay, is, is somebody who receives notice and they report all relevant details about the alleged sexual violence that the student or another person has shared and that the school will need to determine what occurred and resolve the situation. So that's a lot of stuff and I'm gonna break it down into two words. One is the idea that you're put on notice. So this means that a student may come to you and say, you know, I'm really sorry I didn't hand in that assignment. I don't want it to look poorly on my grade, um, but I experienced something over the weekend. I was sexually assaulted and I didn't get my assignment in on time. Now that means you're put on notice and you have to tell the Title IX office. Um, what that means though, as far as the other word which is shared, it means that you're not an investigator. We have two instinct reactions when somebody tells us something and we want them to know that we're compassionately listening to them. One is that we wanna ask questions because we've been taught as a society that active listening, someone tells you something, you ask questions, they tell you more and it goes back and forth. But this is one of those urges you're gonna have to overcome when it comes to being a responsible employee and this is best practice for all people who receive disclosures, even advocates, is that what that person needs is somebody who will listen to what happened to them. Because they may only wanna share so much with you. And what's interesting about the faculty staff relationship towards students is that if you ask a question, students are going to feel like they have to answer. And because sexual violence has so much to do with like power being taken away from someone, we always want to re-empower students. So the best thing we can do is listen and not ask questions that pure curiosity and pure us wanting them to know that we're listening will make us feel like we need to ask. Like where did it happen, when did it happen, what happened? Um, so what I really recommend is that folks sort of prepare this little elevator speech you'll have, this five minute elevator speech where if a student were to come to you and say, I experienced X, you would say, you know, I appreciate that you felt comfortable saying that to me. Um, just so you know, I'm going to notify this person in the Title IX office, and they're gonna talk to you about what your options are, the different support services on campuses, and what the process could look like within Title IX. I know it's hard to sort of sit with that conversation, um, but the other thing is that we never want folks to think that we're offering them advice or telling them what they should do. Um, so if anything, if the student's asking for something, if they need to miss work, if they're a student employee, if they haven't been showing up to something, um, you can help them with that acute issue. You can say, thank you for telling me that, this is who I'm going to tell next, and just so you know how that information's going to be shared, and then let's talk about how you need this assignment moved. Let's talk about whether or not you need to be moved in the dorms. Let's talk about what this means for your work study. Do folks have questions around that? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, what if a student tells you, and this happens a lot too, um, I was sexually assaulted over the weekend, I'm worried about my failing this class, or I'm worried about living in the dorm, and I don't want you to tell anybody. And we'll go into later about why people do or do not disclose, and that's one of them. And a lot of the concern around not, want, not wanting people to find out is one about the concern of retaliation on campus. So we know about 80% of the time that somebody experienced sexual violence, the perpetrator is somebody close to the victim. 
it's a boyfriend, it's a classmate, it's a friend's boyfriend, it's someone in their athletic team, it's somebody within their social group, within their student club, and there's that concern of who's going to find out and will they retaliate against me. So one way I deal with that is by saying, you know, I'm going to tell this one person so that you're building up that trust again. You're saying, you know, I am going to tell somebody, but I'm going to let you know who that is, and they're going to get in contact with you. The other piece is that some students don't want anyone to know because Title IX sounds like a scary process, and it can be, and that's how a lot of processes are that victims unfortunately have to navigate. Um, so the other piece of that is I tend to encompass that piece of I'm going to tell this person, and they're going to let you know what your options are, what support services you can get a hold of on campus, what academic accommodations, and then they're also going to let you know what the Title IX process looks like. So they know what to expect from that person who's contacting them, and so that you're not just saying, I'm gonna tell someone. You're saying, I'm going to tell someone so that we can loop you into this larger support services on campus. Someone else have a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so half of that question is, how is this different than mandatory reporting? So one is that mandatory reporting is sort of a term of art as well, legally, of it's a state, re you are deemed through the state of Oregon a mandatory reporter, and you have to report all types of, for these groups, minors, disabilities, elder. Um, those, you all in this room are most likely mandatory reporters because you're campus employees, so you're mandatory reporters for those types of things. So if a minor comes to you, you know, you have to notify um, law enforcement. But the responsible employee piece is different that it's succinct to students. So students on your campus who may not be minors come to you and they've let you know that you experienced some type of violence. And my concern of when we don't get students wrapped into services is that I've seen far too many times when a student experiences violence and then they just disappear. And it really hurts to see, because you see a student that if it had just been for the change of that one test, if we could just have gotten them out of the dorm that the perpetrator was in, if we could just have gotten them in online classes for a little while, we could have helped that person get to graduation and feel safe on campus. And what's interesting, and I want you all to think about this next week when school starts, is that every single campus I go to, I see the same phenomenon happen. The first week of school, every freshman all of a sudden goes to the bookstore and they have 20 hoodies that say Eastern Oregon on it. They have a bumper sticker that says Eastern Oregon on it. For a whole 30 days, they go to all the sport events <laughs> until it's not cool anymore. Um, they, their mom and dad have an Eastern Oregon bumper sticker. It's a community to them. And there's a lot of studies that have showed that schools see the college they go to as an extended community. Um, and what's hard is when students fall through the cracks um, when they're experiencing trauma, when they need support services, when they need academic accommodations to get them through that. Um, and unfortunately, they're not looped into those services. So as somebody with a background in advocacy, I get it. I get that it's hard. Um, and I get that, at least personally, I used to have this feeling, and I still do to this day, that I don't want to breach that person's trust. You know, this person trusted me, and that's why they told me. Um, and, I, and it hurt me that I couldn't keep it confidential. Um, but what I realized is having that conversation and being upfront with them and saying, I'm going to tell this one person. That does not mean the rest of the school is going to find out. And that person's job is to explain to you the process and it's their job to make sure that you're doing well academically, that you get access to counseling, and that they do some safety planning with you so that we can make you safe on campus. Students tend to react really positively to that, even if in the moment it seems really overwhelming, which it should feel, you know? They're going through a lot, and then they hear that they're being thrown into something else as well. Yeah, so um, campus employees, higher education employees in the state of Oregon are mandatory reporters. Um, so that has to do with minors and folks with disabilities and elder abuse. Mm -hmm. It's, I know it's confusing, so I'm not going to use the word mandatory because that has to do with mandatory reporting, but if a student comes to you, yes, by federal Title IX law, 
you're a responsible employee and you have to tell the Title IX office. But that comes back to we're re-empowering the student how much they want to tell you, which is why I always say don't ask questions. So if a student only wants to share with you, I was sexually assaulted, then that's all you're sharing to the Title IX office. But if you ask questions, if you say who did it, where did it happen, what happened, you're gathering more and more information that the student may not have wanted to share with the Title IX office. Which is why I always say you're gonna have that instinct to do that active listening process, but it's better to put the power back in the student and say, you can share with me as much as you want or don't want to. Um, and sometimes it will happen. You'll have a student come to you who'll just say, something happened over the weekend. And, I, and it's hard and I need an extension. Or something happened and I really don't like my roommate anymore, can I get changed into a different dorm? By not asking questions and just saying, okay, I hear that you're feeling unsafe, let's try and fix this, you're, letting, you're giving that student power to only share how much they wanna share with you. And a good follow-up with that to get students back into the services is to say, um, what I'm hearing is maybe you experienced something and just so you know, we have counseling services on campus, here's the phone number to counseling services and also just so you know, if it has anything to do with sexual violence, dating violence or anything like that, we also have a Title IX coordinator on campus. Um, so really what we're doing is we're always framing it around options the student has. Because the hard thing about sexual violence and domestic violence is that society has so many ideas around what that person should have done in the moment. So the last thing that person wants to hear is what they should do next. So the best thing we can do to empower that person is to say, you have options on campus and I'm more than happy to let you know what those options are. And you know, I know some folks, staff, faculty, who just keep the counseling phone number on their desk in their office if a student came in and have it on hand. Um, I even know some folks who in their syllabi include it and say, you know, if anything arises during the semester, feel free to talk to me, but also know there's people on campus you can talk to. Especially because, you know, counseling services are confidential. That's privileged information. So the student can go talk to them and that person can never tell anybody. So it's an option to them. Um, yeah, so what about third-hand information, things like that? So if a student came to you and said, you know, my best friend who's also a student is, was sexually assaulted or her boyfriend is abusing her, um, that still is like being put on notice. The other is, an, is if um, a student on your campus is a perpetrator. So maybe they're saying my best friend isn't on this campus but my boyfriend assaulted her type of thing, all that information needs to go to your Title IX folks. And that tends, you'd be surprised how little information you get. It really is. Students will say, um, my best friend experienced this and I'm really worried about her. So all you can say to the Title IX office is, I have this student, this is her name, I don't know who her best friend is, but they're worried. Um, and that's why I try to remind folks around responsible employee obligations is that it's the same as sort of what, I've, what I ever heard in direct service and community programs as an advocate. It's like so few of the time do folks want to get into details. 90% of the time they just want someone to hear that they're hurting and then they want to know if there's something on campus that can help them so they can get back on track. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you would say so-and-so student told me this. But you know, it's up to that student. You know, the Title IX office may contact that student. The student may say, I don't remember who my friend was. And you know, that's a student's right. <laughs> and so that's why you know, I think we still are giving power back to the student. Because that student still can control how much they tell. And we do a really good job, or at least we're trying to do an even better job here in Oregon of training our Title IX offices about how to ask these types of questions in a way that's trauma informed. Understanding that students are going through a traumatic process and they're part of this um, larger Title IX process now and how do we approach it in a way that they feel like they have some control over the process and in a way that they understand that they have different services available to them and that they know what they need best.
Yeah. Um, so there is a way to do that in a way that you know you're not stopping them from talking. So over the years we started to call it an empathetic interruption, um, which basically is you know there's times like maybe you work really closely with students and you can tell that student's been struggling. Maybe they're not showing up for practice. They're not showing up for class anymore. Something's going on. Um, and there's like that gut reaction that a lot of folks in higher ed have when that student says, can we talk privately? You know, I've been struggling with something. And you have one of two options. You know, one thing you can do is if you get that student who says, hey, can we talk privately? I've been struggling with something. You can say, hey, just so you know, I'm more than happy to talk and we can go into my office. It's a little quieter in there. Um, but just so you know, if it has to do with sexual harassment or sexual violence or anything, I do have some, I do have to tell the Title IX coordinator. Um, but if that's okay with you, let's go into my office. I'm more than happy to talk about it. But if you don't want to tell me anymore, um, I am more than happy to give you the phone number of counseling services on campus and you can talk to them privately. Um, now if a student just lays it on you, which is majority of what happens, um, what you can do is, let's say they say, you know, I was sexually assaulted over the weekend. You can interrupt them for a second and say, um, I'm really sorry to hear that happened. I really appreciate that you felt comfortable telling me this. Um, just so you know, I, I need to share that information with our Title IX coordinator. And then go into your elevator speech of, they're gonna let you know what the process is, let you know what your options are. And just so you know, I'm here to talk to you about that. But anything you tell me, I'm gonna have to let that next person know. So you can either tell me knowing that, or you can wait and have a conversation with the Title IX coordinator and they can let you know more about um, what that looks like and who knows what. And then again, loop them back to counseling services because all of it's confidential. That's why I say really um, practice your elevator speech. Because when the moment hits you, it's gonna be uncomfortable and you're gonna fumble around it and that's okay. But if you at least sort of know what you're gonna say, it's gonna make it go a lot smoother for the student if you at least look somewhat comfortable um, through the disclosure. But you know, there's a lot of ways to sort of have that conversation in a way that doesn't seem abrupt. You'd be surprised. The other thing is I can maybe count on one hand how many people have come to me even when I was an advocate and went into detail. It just tends not to happen. Um, I mean, sometimes it'll happen if you have perpetrator and victim in the same group. Maybe they're on the same team, they're in the same student group. Um, but majority of the time, students are gonna be really vague about it and they mostly just need help with that immediate thing that they're coming to you for. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jackie's here. Yeah, and I know some folks who honestly just have like a little cheat sheet on their desk. And it's just sitting there, and then if a student ever were to come in, they have the phone numbers ready. Yeah, so the question is, you know, who should be the contact person, male or female, and should there be options? Um, we used to struggle with this in law enforcement as well. Should there be two investigators, one of each gender? What we've actually learned is that um, it, survivors don't have a preference. The other piece is when we um, sort of base it on that, we tend to think that all or majority of sexual violence occurs in heterosexual situations where there's a lot of same-sex assaults, um, there's also a lot of, like on some, in certain populations like campuses, we have a lot of male on male assaults that, you know, they then want to go to a male person as well. Um, so it's, you know, pretty common that we'd have 
one Title IX coordinator or one person to go to. And what we've seen through surveying victims and survivors is that there's not a strong preference. But if a student were to say, I don't feel comfortable going to that person because they're a man or they're a woman, um, the school will always make an accommodation around that. You know, the Title IX office will figure out somebody else to sub in um, to have that conversation with them, or they'll offer to have someone else in the room. And they'll say, it doesn't have to be just you and me. Is it okay if we have this person from the counseling office or this other person come into the room? And you know, there's a lot of things we work with Title IX folks around even like how their office should be placed. Like the fact that their desk should never cut off the student from the door, like make them feel that they always have a way to escape the room if they ever want to, leave the door open. There's extensive things that we go into sort of around that process of trauma and making people feel safe in environments. That's a good question. Okay, if folks have questions, if we keep going, feel free to raise your hand. Um, the other interesting side piece of this is that perpetration piece. So now what's interesting is that it tends for us to be hard to have this conversation on campuses because we talk about violence on campus very one-sidedly. We say that violence happens on campus, people are victimized on campus, um, and we have these conversations as if there was no perpetrator involved. And that's a conversation we tend to have in the community as well. So the way we talk about this sometimes is we'll start with, a, with something that happens where we'll say, you know, John beat Mary. And it's an incident that happened, and this is how it's first discussed. And slowly as we discuss it, it turns into Mary was beaten by John. So now Mary's the direct object of the sentence, but John's at least still in the sentence. Um, we quickly go from that to Mary was beaten. So who's missing from the sentence altogether? John. Um, and then we quickly go from this to Mary was battered. So now there wasn't even an active person exerting violence against Mary. Um, and then we pretty quickly adopt a label for Mary. We go to Mary as a battered woman. So now we started with John beat Mary. John did this thing to Mary. So we tend to end up at Mary as a battered woman. We do the same thing on campus. You know, you'll read headlines that say, woman was abducted, woman sexually assaulted while walking her dog, woman raped in college park apartments. The perpetrator's never part of the conversation. So it's easier for us to talk about violence without that other person. And I think it's especially easy for us to do that on college campuses because we're a closed community. Um, so it's easier for us to say that person did something I would never do that made them unsafe. As opposed to saying maybe there's something about the community that at times is unsafe. Um, now what's interesting is how many folks in here were raised through these conversations with stranger danger? Like the strangers are dangerous, stay away from strangers, and then the colloquial stranger danger. Um, when you talk to students, we're still sort of there. Students still hear this. Um, there's a lot of conversations around like what do perpetrators look like? Um, the big part of it is like what does the cliche sex offender drive? White van. Um, so you say with students, you say like what does he drive? And all the students go, oh, sketchy white van. And I'm like, okay. Um, it, it is interesting because when I go to training, so there's always a debate, is there kittens in the van or is there candy? That's about the only variation I get. Um, the other piece is like, what does an offender look like? And I hear a lot of, you know, he has facial hair, he's dirty, he's tattooed, maybe he's wearing like dark sunglasses and a hoodie. And so at this point, I've just become really concerned about every hipster guy in Portland. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very concerned about Multnomah County. But it's, it's funny because this is sort of these stereotypes we've gone on with, right? Um, it's that creepy guy. It'd be really easy if campus safety just like roamed around the parking lot and like kept all the sketchy vans away. Um, all of our jobs would be a lot easier. I would have no job security. Um, but really, you know, we know that these things aren't true. Um, and if it were true, everyone's job around safety would be so much easier. Um, but if we were to look at sort of the high profile cases we've had in the last year, this is what we see. Um, we have the gentleman on the right, if folks remember this, he went to a preparatory school and they found out for decades this preparatory school had been upholding the tradition of targeting young women um, and a whole fostering of things that led to quite a folks being sexually assaulted and one woman came forward. Um, and of course in good media fashion, the whole case was aired on TV and this woman had to talk about the assault on live national television. 
Um, but he was very well respected. He was off to go to an Ivy League college. And we have these gentlemen on the left. Um, they were varsity sports, straight A students, both on Dean's list, well respected in the community. When the woman came forward, she, um, the vast majority of people on campus said, I refuse to believe it because they're just such nice guys. The only reason it actually ended up getting picked up in the end is because they found a recording of the whole assault that happened in the residence halls. And so I think what we, these conversations lean us towards is the idea that it's not sort of this um, person on the fringe of society. Um, it can also be our student leaders, our people who are well respected, those who are doing well academically, those with scholarships, and that this has a lot to do with whether people come forward or not. Um, and that fear of retaliation and that fear of whether or not they're going to be taken seriously. Um, what we do know is that, you know, there's three things that perpetrators tend to look for is whether or not someone's vulnerable, accessible, and lacking credibility. The other thing is whether or not somebody can be made to be any of those three things. So if we were to take um, a population at high risk, let's say um, a freshman who's drinking underage, do we think an intoxicated um, underage drinker is vulnerable. Um, they're definitely accessible. And maybe most of campus might not see them as the most credible because of the fact that they were drinking underage. Now when we look at these three things, we can also unfortunately line up with this list about if a student's on campus undocumented, um, maybe a student with disabilities, all of these populations are vulnerable, accessible, and within mainstream um, processes of reporting, people may not think they have a lot of credibility. Now, what's interesting is that there was a study done um, in the late 90s around perpetrators specifically on college campuses, which really shifted our mindset away from this idea that there were perpetrators and they had MOs and they only perpetrated one type of violence. Um, until David Lisak did a study where he asked for male participants on a college campus, and about 1,900 men came forward. And out of those 1,900 men, he said, have you ever had sexual intercourse with an adult when they didn't want to because you used physical force, twisting their arm, holding them down, et cetera, if they didn't cooperate? Out of those 1,900 men, 120 of them said yes to that question. So we had 120 men on campus who had done some form of that act. What he realized out of interviewing them was that those individuals employed certain techniques with different women on campus and also um, uh, some male victims on campus as well of this behavior of grooming them, finding out their school schedule, what classes they had, where they lived in the residence halls, um, creating vulnerability through alcohol. So one thing that almost all the men across the board used was alcohol as a way to make people vulnerable. Um, and then also language. So they would talk to a freshman. There's one certain perpetrator who would talk to a freshman and say, hey, you know, we're throwing this party. It's really exclusive. We only invite so many girls. You should come. And made the person feel really special. Um, so that by the time she got there, she um, didn't think it was weird that he was paying a lot of attention to her and felt almost too embarrassed to leave at that point. The other thing that was interesting out of these um, folks is about 80% of the time, um, it's a classmate, a boyfriend, a friend, a friend of a friend who's the perpetrator. Um, and this crossover idea, the fact that we know about 51% of all rape victims are also experiencing some type of intimate partner violence. So when Lisak interviewed these 120 men, out of the 120 of them, they had committed 483 rapes. They'd also committed 53 acts of sexual assault, 319 acts of child abuse, 95 acts of physical abuse, and 275 acts of domestic violence. Which shows us that when we're having this conversation, I know the perpetrator piece is hard to take, but we're not saying that all men on our campus are perpetrating. Mostly especially because I would never want to have that view of men, right? Um, but what we are saying is that a small minority of individuals on campus have a multitude of victims. And that's what we see, that's what we tend to see on campus, is that um, we have a very small percentage of individuals perpetrating against a large amount of people. So if we know one in five people on our campus will experience sexual violence, that's happening from a very small group of perpetrators. Um, 
The other thing we've learned is that the reason why people don't want to come forward, and a lot of this we talked about with the what do you do when someone discloses to you, is this idea of fear of retaliation, embarrassment of what happened, um, not knowing what's next. So like not knowing what Title IX is, not knowing what it means that someone else might find out. Um, and then of course, afraid that they're not gonna be believed. A lot of the times folks ask me the question around false reports, how do we know? Um, what's interestingly enough is it's really hard for us to find out false reports and anyone who's into statistics will notice two to eight percent is a very large margin. And a lot of what that has to do with is the fact that when it comes to like the criminal justice process, for example, once a victim gets engaged, once a victim tells somebody what happened, there's not a lot of ways for them to exit the criminal justice process. It moves forward without them. So the only way a victim can get out is if they say, I made it all up. And a lot of the times when we look at the statistic of, you know, the closer the relationship is, <coughs> the less likely they're gonna wanna come forward. And 80% is happening by a classmate or boyfriend. Um, it's really easy for us to understand why some individuals would rather say I made it all up. The other interesting thing is the two to eight percent is half of majority of other crimes false reporting. So like burglary, robberies, theft. Um, and I think a lot of that also has to do with the fact that most people don't want to come forward and say that such an intimate thing happened to them. Um, the last bit of this conversation is around the pieces of trauma. I think it's especially important for everyone in this room um, because when we look at trauma and long-lasting trauma, we see that these are the elements that are um, going to lead to high risk of post-traumatic stress disorder. So whether or not they felt betrayed, extreme fear, surprise, blame, lack of support, and validation. But what's most intriguing is that these are the three that are most closely linked to long-term post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, as somebody who worked on campuses and somebody who's a direct service provider, I can't control the betrayal if they felt betrayed by the uh, perpetrator. I can't control if they were afraid or if it was a surprise, and neither can any of you in this room. Um, but the things we can control are these three, which are also um, the most important correlation to post-traumatic stress. We can make sure that they don't feel blamed, we can make sure they feel supported and validate what happened to them. Now when we look at other individuals who are at high risk for PTSD, um, so if we were to take one that's unfortunately timely these days, um, children exposed to school shootings, we see that it tends to be lower than female victims of rape. Now, I don't know, personally, I always find that, found that really surprising. Um, until we start to look at, you know, would that child be blamed for what happened? Would the community support them? Would the community acknowledge that that was a scary event? Now, when we do the same thing for a female victim of rape, we come up with different answers to these questions, which explains to us why um, this population of individuals has such high rates of PTSD. What's also interesting is that that means on our campuses we can actually decrease this number by just making sure that that first person they tell gives them a compassionate response and make sure that we somehow get them uh, involved in some type of counseling services or academic services or some type of support services on campus. Um, the other part of this is that students have sort of reached out and said that another part of the traumatic experience is whether or not they felt like the person talking to them took it seriously. Um, so out of students who had disclosed to somebody on campus, 90% never ended up telling, um, making a formal report to a Title IX coordinator if that initial res first response, that initial faculty member, staff employee, felt like they didn't believe them or didn't hear them or didn't take the time to give them a compassionate response. Um, also, 86% of those who'd met some type of statutory rape um, never told the university source. So that means that um, for those of you in this room who may be somebody who a student walks into your office and says something happened to me over the weekend, um, the way that you respond to that student and the way that you let that student know that you're listening and that their services on campuses can actually be um, the difference between a student getting, uh, talking to somebody about it and getting academic accommodations or them just leaving the campus altogether. The other piece of this was sort of this question of what should it sound like when someone discloses to you? 
And I think individuals who I've known on campuses who have received disclosures were always really surprised by that. Um, at least myself, I'll admit that I had a bias when I first came into this work of, I thought everybody who disclosed to me would be somehow hysterical or frantic about it. And I'll never forget a disclosure that I got one time that really stuck with me where the person was telling me a pretty horrific event that happened to them and they were giggling throughout the disclosure. And it totally caught me off guard. Um, it wasn't something I'd expected and no one had really talked to me about. Um, but I think in that moment, I realized that people react to trauma differently. And so a lot of studies we've done have told us exactly that. So they did a lot of work where they had people come into emergency rooms who'd experienced some type of trauma, whether it'd been a car accident, a fight, sexual violence, a shooting, some type of trauma had happened to the body. Um, and they would start doing brain scans and then blood work to figure out what chemicals were being released in the body and then simultaneously what was happening to the brain during trauma. What they noticed about the brain is that your prefrontal cortex, that part of your brain that does complex thought, um, that helps you make decisions, that lets you walk into a room, analyze the room, decide where you're gonna sit, what you're going to do next, was no longer lighting up on the brain scan. That meant people who are experiencing trauma can't access that part of their brain that does complex thoughts. The one part of their brain that was highly lit up was their amygdala, which is our old caveman brain. That's the part that keeps you breathing, keeps your heart beating, keeps you doing very basic functions, and also kicks in that fight or flight mentality. Now this explained a lot for when students were coming forward and saying this happened to me, but I don't know why. I didn't scream, I didn't yell, I didn't run, I didn't fight back, I didn't know what to do. The other interesting thing they found out was that um, there was four chemicals being released in the bloodstream through all individuals. And this had to do a lot of explaining why the disclosures sounded the way they did. So for example, one chemical that's released in the body is an opioid. Um, for anyone in this room that's ever had any type of major surgery and you had to be on opiates for it, you'll know that how did you feel when you took those? Probably numb, zoned out, not responsive. Um, people who release high levels of that when they go through trauma are the individuals who will come and talk to you about it and they'll be really monotone. Um, they won't have a lot of influx in their voice. They'll be really monotone talking to you about it and just kind of give you responses back. They also realize that there's some people who have high levels of oxytocin in their blood when they go through trauma. And these are the individuals who nervously laugh, maybe trying to explain it to you, they're giggling, or just out of nervousness, they, they are cracking a joke or laughing through it. Um, so what we realized was that every individual is releasing different levels of this, and we can pretty narrowly identify how people disclose based on it. Um, the other thing we realized is that fight or flight isn't actually what happens to individuals. Um, and I think we like to think fight or flight because all of us in our brains are kind of like if anybody ever attacked me in the middle of the night, I would immediately become a martial arts expert. Um, I would become like a crime fighting hero and that or I'd run away and it would be, you know, like the most heroic experience of your life. Really what we've realized is that it's fight, flight or freeze. And most specifically, it's freeze than fight or flight. Um, and we've sort of known this about the body before. This is why law enforcement practice using their weapons. This is why the military does muscle memory. It's because your instinct reaction isn't to run or fight. Your instinct reaction is to freeze up. And so individuals who have to do a lot of contact fighting with, other, with um, like military law enforcement do a lot of muscle memory to overcome that instinct to freeze. Um, and this happens a lot when we hear about individuals who say, I just froze, I didn't do anything. And you know, we see this in a lot of other situations where, um, for instance, I went to college in Idaho in a very rural area where there was absolutely nothing to do. And so there's these things around called fainting goats. Has anyone ever seen a fainting goat? Good. I say that in Portland, everyone's like, I've never heard of a fainting goat. Um, if you haven't, you should YouTube it. It'll give you at least two minutes of entertainment. Um, so in college, we were really bored, there's nothing to do, so we'd go and accost the fainting goats, which, <laughs> you know, I just have to own up to that in my life. Um, so what you do is you walk up to them, and they freeze up and fall over. It doesn't hurt them, you don't actually touch them. I feel like some folks are judging me at this point. Um, and that's just what they do, it's a mechanism. They get scared, they freeze up, they fall. 
Same as sharks. I don't recommend trying this, but you can flip a shark on its, shark on its back and it sort of gets paralyzed there. Same as bunny rabbits. If you take a bunny rabbit and flip it on its back, it freezes. Um, a lot of animals, including humans, have this instinctual reaction to freeze up. So I'm going to show a really quick video. What a weirdo. Oh! You scared the shit out of me. <laughs> So oh I want you to God. notice what's happening. I think um, it, I right think when people get scared, you what do they do? You um, I want you to see sort of that freeze they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I knew you were there. Yeah, I knew you were there. All right. Whoa, did you? Is there someone in there? Did you, did you touch him? <laughs> Wait. To hold them accountable. Oh, God. <laughs> Don't ever do that. <laughs> Someone's been going through some training. <laughs> Um, so I think what we get away from this is one, that that woman should be hanging out on the sidewalk with us at all times. Um, and also this idea that we would love to think we just immediately go into fight position like she did, or we just book it. But there's this moment of paralyzed freeze um, that happens before that instinctual piece sort of knocks in. So mostly what I want us to walk away from today is this idea that we all play a role on campus in this larger conversation that um, you know, we're working towards best practices on campuses and that most of all students are experiencing how to be a student, they're experiencing a new community, um, new experiences of higher education, college, all of this, and that some of our students will experience violence on campus or they'll experience it off campus, that it comes into contact with everything they do. It's going to be hard for them academically, it's going to be hard for them um, in their social groups, and that the most we can do is give them a compassionate ear to listen to and bring them back into the services on campuses that can help them get back on track. And what I found most interesting about this work when I first started doing all of this is I had this very vivid idea that my success working with somebody had a lot to do, if not everything to do, with whether or not that perpetrator was convicted and incarcerated. Because that's how I saw justice in my own eyes. And I thought that that person that I was helping wasn't going to feel justice themselves or feel complete unless that happened. Um, and probably the most beneficial thing I ever came across was a study done by um, a national partner of ours who does a lot of work on trauma and a lot of work on how people can receive disclosures and help individuals. And what she found out from surveying countless amounts of victims is that um, the victim survivor who experiences a supportive and compassionate response regardless of whether or not the criminal justice outcome goes a certain way, a Title IX outcome goes a certain way, regardless of all of that, they have lower rates of post-traumatic stress. 
So the thing that we can control the most, which is whether or not they feel safe coming to us, and then how we react when they do that, um, is really what's most critical about them being successful individuals and staying on campus and having a positive um, reflection of their time here. Um, so with that, I appreciate all the work that you all tirelessly do on campus, and I appreciate the opportunity to come to Eastern Oregon and watch snowman videos with you, so thank you.